Hey there, welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel, and today we're going to talk about henchmen, hirelings, retainers, mercenaries, specialists, all that good stuff. Um, I get asked about this a lot, and I think it's one of those subjects where if you have mostly played, let's say, later editions of the game, or maybe other games besides Dungeons & Dragons, it might seem odd to you, especially if you're uh, kind of getting into, let's say you picked up OSC, and you're just like, oh, it seems like it should be a big part of what they call the old school gaming right so how do we even use them what's the proper proper way to use it um and how do we go through so i'm going to kind of run through my thoughts on this i think they can be a really important part of the game i think they're really useful and i don't think they have to be too uh over the top you can keep them pretty simple so as always with these things the first thing i always do when i'm thinking about how i would run a game i go back to how i learned where i learned from and i talk about this a lot I learned from Moldway Basic, or BX as they call it now nowadays. Um, my, me and my friend Stephen, we read the books, we learned to ourselves to play. So let's see what Tom Moldway has to say here. I'm sharing my screen, and you're looking at page B21, uh, the retainer section here. And let's just see what, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let's just see what it says. So a retainer, or hireling, is a person hired by the player character, PC, right, uh, to aid the character on an adventure. The number of retainers who will follow the piece is limited by that of the character's charisma score. So this is where charisma becomes important. If the retainer is not well treated, he or she is likely to stop working for the PC and will tell others of the mistreatment. So these are not just bodies to put in front of the party. You know, they will report back to town. Or if they don't show up back at town, right? It could be a problem. Um, uh, retainers are more than just men in arms, though. They're, they're not just soldiers for hire. Uh, to protect the employee, but they take reasonable risks. So they're basically party members. They're like, you could look at them like almost like a junior party member. Um, they're not, not going to take every risk. They're not going to do everything, uh, but they're kind of like you're taking them under your wing and you're bringing them into these dungeons to help you. Uh, retainers, are, oh, yeah, retainers are lieutenants or assistants to the PC and are expected to lend their skills and knowledge to benefit the party and to take same risks as uh, characters face. One good use for retainers when you might see them is you'll often see these modules, these old modules, and they'll say for six to ten characters. And, you know, most people aren't playing with that many players. So a good way to kind of fill out the group is with retainers and hirelings. So, you you know, you've got your players and one's playing a fighter and the other one's playing a dwarf and one's playing a cleric. And they're going to go into this dungeon. And maybe you're like, well, you know, it'd be useful if we had a thief or a magic user or, or you know, additional dwarf maybe because you're going to dun a dungeon. And this is where you want to pick up your, your hirelings slash retainers um, for this purpose. They're really kind of the flesh out the party. And, you know, in in more practical sense, they're great to have. Uh, and I'll talk about this more at the end. I'm going to kind of just go through the rules first. But um, they're good to have as backups. You know, you're in the middle of a dungeon. Uh, you know... Of course, if you're in the middle of a dungeon and you're just playing with three of your friends and they each are only running one player character and one of them dies, of course you're just going to have them eventually run into another PC somewhere. You know, the person who dies is going to write up somebody really quickly and then three rooms later they're going to be wandering around the dungeon because we want our friends to play, right? But a, a, a <laughs> that can become a little bit sillier if you want something that's a little bit more kind of realistic. You will be in a position where these henchmen have already been with the party. And even if they were hired by the, the, the PC that just passed, you're going to be able to trust them, whatever else. The, the, basically, the character can just, or the player can take over those, those uh, henchmen as PCs at that point, point. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So hiring, I'm not going to read all this, but basically you want to hire retainers. You put up signs in towns. You, you go to the taverns. You can role play this as much or as little as you want. It doesn't say that, but I'll tell you right now. I mean, generally for me, what I'll do is I'll keep on hand a handful of uh, possible hirelings slash retainers. And if somebody tells me they're looking, I'll just roll randomly to see which ones are available. That's kind of how I do it. I don't get too far into the, the, the role play of it, of looking for them. But you certainly can do that, especially if you're playing a more city-based adventure. Or if this is the third time they've come back to town looking for retainers, and every time they come back, all the previous ones are gone, right? And you might want to start role playing that. But, you know, they put up some signs. They talk about it. You'll do a little hiring process. Uh, what I usually do is ask the player to just kind of state what they're going to offer for the, for the henchmen and, and, you know, if they're going to tell them essentially what's going on or if they're keeping anything from them, <laughs> you know, as far as like where they're going. Uh, and then we'll roll on the, the table, the reaction table, uh, modified but with, by the initial offer 
um, the charisma of the, the PC, etc. And that will help whether or not they get hired. I mean, that's basically it. There are a couple of things here, though. Uh, level of retainers. A retainer can be of any level, but it can't be of a level greater than the PC. So if I create four or five uh, NPCs that are available and one of them happens to be second level, but a first level PC is looking higher, they can't hire them. A retainer is, a, again, they're a, they're a lieutenant, like an assistant. They're not going to work for somebody of lower level than them, generally. So, you know, unless you have some kind of plot point where you want to use that, I would stay away from that kind of thing. Um, it does specifically say that elves, elves and dwarves are rarely retainers. In my games, that's usually how I play it, unless you're in a town that's all elves and dwarves. I usually... Uh, allow only elves and dwarves to be retainers for the like. So elves can have elvish retainers, dwarves can have dwarvish ones. Um, but everybody else, most retainers are human. That's just how I play it because I play mostly human centric, as you might guess if you've watched enough of these videos. Um, so you've got your loyalty. Now that's based on essentially the morale score, which in BX is based on uh, the charisma, right? So your charisma is going to set a base morale score, which can be modified by the hiring and also over time by how, you're, how they're treated. Um, and things like that. So you might have them start off with a seven uh, morale, but then let's say you go on the first adventure and you guys get an especially big uh, uh, score of loot and you give them kind of an extra bonus or, you know, they you you give them a magic weapon or something like that that they, wasn't in their contract. That might boost their morale, at least for a while. One thing that I think a lot of people don't think about is that morale, a lot of times in BX, people are using it during combat and they'll be like, okay, you're attacked by a bunch of goblins, do the NPCs run? I mean, that's how you're supposed to use it, right? But also, if you check here, um, we can see that retainer's loyalty and morale is based uh, on the charisma, as I just explained. It should be checked whenever the extraordinary danger is met during an adventure. But then the next sentence says, loyalty should also be checked after each adventure. So for me, what I would do is, you're going to look at how they were overall treated. Did they get any kind of bonuses? Were they treated well? Were they made to do things like that they probably should, you know, maybe more risk than, than they should have taken? And that will attract, that will raise or lower the morale, um, the, the role, I should say, right now for loyalty. So I, would, I wouldn't have it adjust the morale for it's just, if it's just a minor thing, but if it's a major thing, it could. Uh, but what I would do is definitely roll for a morale check. So you may have a retainer that... You know, you treat it really well and you give them a tip and everything, but if you just, you know, luck of the dice, they might just be like, you know what, I think adventuring is not for me. And they might move on. So uh, their retainers slash henchmen are not forever. They can come and go. You might even hire them later. They might choose to come on another adventure with you later on, but they might back off after one adventure. So another thing here as a, as a piece of advice, which is basically how we played when we were kids, we didn't really use... Uh, uh, for this stuff, retainers so much. We just ran extra player characters. Um, it, it It is effectively the same thing from the point of view of the player, in my mind, because we'll talk about that a little bit. But, you know, it, it just, you know, they just made another character and they just joined the party. That's kind of how we did it. And that's what they recommend here. And that's probably where I got it from. Retainers are often used to strengthen a party, which I told you that. Um, it's, re it's recommended that the DM not allow beginning players to hire retainers. New players tend to use retainers as a crutch, right? If the dungeon is difficult, a DM should let the player run more than one character. Now, this is the kind of thing where, where we, we're going to start to talk about this a little bit more in an interesting way. Because I think this is one of the questions people have. Like, how do you run the, the retainers? You, meaning me, because they asked me. Um, in almost every case, I run the retainers just like their player characters. In other words, if... My care if my player Crystal hires a, you know, she's a, let's say an elf, she hires a human fighter, let's say as a retainer, I will literally just let her run the fighter more or less how she wants to run it. Um, I might have some notes on the person, like about their personality or whatever, and she can play up into that or down. If it comes to a point where I think she's going to have them do something that I don't think makes sense, um, then I will step in and say, uh, no, they wouldn't do that, um, and I'll just take them over temporarily. Um, this is something that, as a DM, you shouldn't do if it's somebody's player character. So if you use the advice above and they're running two characters, obviously you don't do that. You don't go, your character wouldn't do that. Player characters, the, the, the PCs, the player can decide whatever they want their player character to do. If it's a retainer, though, I might step in and say that. Usually I'll do it in a very gentle way. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be like, you can't do that. Give me that. I'll be like, I don't think that they do that. Or I might even roll a morale check, you know? It's like, uh, oh, oh, my henchman's going to stick their hand in that hole after, you know, the last retainer did that and, and 
ran off screaming, you know, <laughs> probably not. So no. Um, but if you were like, well, my retainer's going to take their pole arm and shove it down the hole. Okay, that's fine. You know, and you can basically do that. Uh, this keeps a lot of the stress off the DM. Um, and if you're wondering as a player, does that become really complicated? What I would generally say is as a player, treat these retainers as basically kind of stat block characters. Like, don't give them a little personality if you want, but you don't need to have them have long conversations with somebody. They're basically just there for muscle and for skills. You don't need to role play them all the time. They can, you know, just kind of do whatever. You know, typically you're going to be like, yeah, they're guarding the, the camp. You know, that's kind of... You don't have to get into long explanations of what these guys are doing, so it's not going to be too much burden on the, the players either. We want the retainers to be a boon to the game and not to slow it down, right? So you're going to basically, if you've got like a couple of fighter retainers, you know, when you're all settled in camp and the party's planning the, the rest of the adventure, you know, oh, how are we going to attack this camp? You know, they're playing dice or something, or they're on guard duty. You don't need to have them involved and do voices for them and all this stuff. Just, they're extra, right? When, when it becomes necessary, they'll come into play. So that's how I would run them, uh, simply enough. Now, essentially, uh, that's more or less all it says here. Let's go back to the book. So we've got this experience points here. It says that the retainers will earn experience for adventures, just like player characters do, rise in level, character class ones that gain enough experience. Retainers, however, receive half experience PC would receive uh, because they're following orders. So this is one of those areas that has been kind of... Uh, gone back and forth you have different people talk about this or how they handle it or whatever the situation is and i'm going to say how i normally do it and then i'll throw out some other examples and i'm also going to talk for a second about something i literally just looked at in osc which i think is pretty smart so the way that i normally do it is i take the experience the the number of pcs and i multiply it by two because they're essentially instead of looking at a retainer is worth half a share you make the retainer worth you make the pcs worth two shares that's just easier math so you take your number of PCs, let's say that you've got three of them, that's, so that's six total shares for PCs, one share for the retainers, that's seven. Let's say for easy math, there was 7,000 experience points. I would divide it by, um, divide that up, so that's a thousand, right? So the retainer would get a thousand, and each PC would get 2,000. That's kind of how I divide the experience points. This is not exactly correct by a lot of people, the way a lot of people do it. So, but I find that this is just easy um, and just kind of works. Now, another way to do it is to base the retainers, uh, the, way, well, the other way people look at it is if they would actually count a full share for a retainer. So in the case of the three PCs plus the retainer, they would say, okay, well, that's four people. So let's divide the experience by four. And then the retainer just gets half of that. And that doesn't exactly work out the same. So my way of doing it is just the way I do it. So, uh, you know, you could do it either way. Both ways work. Uh, there's a, th a third way, which it didn't even occur to me until I was just looking at OSE. And let me show you this. This is actually kind of interesting. So his example here is pretty interesting, right? So number one, okay, let me, let me start with that. Another thing is too, when you're gonna hire a retainer, you need to, to offer them a share. So you can look at it a lot of different ways. The way I have normally done it is if you go to a retainer and you say you're going to get a 20% share, what I'm talking about is a 20% share of the the PC's treasure because they're the one hiring, right? So if if Crystal's hiring a fighter and she gets 1,000 gold pieces and 20% of that is 200, so she will pay out of her share 200 gold pieces to that fighter and she'll keep 800, right? Um, that's how I've always done it. But SC kind of shows a different way of doing it, which I think is interesting. Um, let's go over here. So they've got, they talk about the same thing, but they say a 50% share. And what they do when they do their example here, which I think is super interesting, is fractional shares of treasure are calculated by dividing the treasure by the total number of shares. So the way they're doing it is five PCs plus a henchman. They're dividing all the treasure by 5.5. This is actually pretty good. Um, if you do it this way, then what you can do is whatever treasure the henchman gets, that's how you calculate their experience points, because of course you get most of your experience points treasure. And of course, remember, they get penalized 50% because they only get half the experience points. So this is kind of an interesting way to do it. And this is one of the areas that you're really going to have to discuss and figure out with your group because there's lots of ways to handle it. Um, and that's one thing I'm going to talk about at the very end. I just want to get through, through all the, the rules first, and then we'll talk about some options. So this is OSC, that's all I want to look at there. 
Okay, so let's take a quick look at this math. That might be easier this way. I got my iPad here. So let's say you're going to do it uh, the way that you're going to use a, uh, the henchman is a half a share. So again, we've got three player characters. Okay, so then you got six shares. You've got one hireling. Is one share. If if we have a total of let's say seven thousand experience points, we're going to divide it by the total number of shares, making each share of experience point one thousand. Of course, a PC is worth two shares, so PCs will get two thousand experience points each, and your hireling will get one thousand. Super simple math like that. Using the same type of math, if we look at the example from OSE, basically works out to be the same. If we take the 7,000, right, and we divide it by 3.5, what we get is 2,000. And of course, if we divide the henchman's share in half, then they get 1,000. So basically, the math is the same. It looked very different to me, but uh, for some reason, now that I'm looking at it, it is actually the exact same math as I did. And maybe this is a simpler technique for a lot of people. If we take the other example that, that a lot of people will use. So you've got one hireling and three PCs. Now you've got four shares. Right? And if we divide our 7,000 by four, what we end up with is, um, let's see, that's one. Testing my math skills here. Uh, seven, right? Is that right? Yep, something like that. 1750. So now we're getting less experience points per PC. And if you divide that in half, I think that's like about 875 for the henchman. So doing it the other way by doing the four shares up front and then subtracting, you're actually lowering the overall experience points for the whole group. So I prefer the method that Gavin has in OSC or doing it my way, which is basically the same math. Um, the other thing I wanted to take a quick look at was, um, is expert. So now in the expert book, they talk about specialists and mercenaries. So these are different. A specialist is somebody that you can just hire to do a thing. They don't go on adventures with you. Um, so if you want to hire an armorer, an animal trainer, or an alchemist, a sage, right? You can pay them X number of gold pieces per month to like, you, let's say you found a whole bunch of stuff or you're trying to figure out the, the way to, you know, uh, close a, a portal or whatever. And you've got a bunch of information, um, but you, you're at your wit's end, right? You don't know. Um, you're doing some adventuring. You can go to a sage and pay them and they will advise you. They'll look through books. You know, that's what they do, right? So that's what, that's what that is. And then mercenaries are essentially your soldiers. They're for mostly for strongholds and stuff, but they can go on wilderness adventures if it's for like clearing areas or I'll sometimes you allow it if um if they're just kind of going out if the party's just like going out there into the wilderness and they need to have some muscle, um, almost like a caravan, you could do that. And they're hired a lot differently. Basically, they are hired based on the, uh, what kind of equipment they have, what their race is, and their morale is handled a little bit differently. But essentially, these are zero levels or, or whatever, or no level, if you want to look at it that way. They're just basic people. They don't get experience points. They just get paid a rate, and they fight. You still want to make sure you keep them happy, because if you have 50, uh, you know, archers working for you, and they get mad, and you're in the middle of the wilderness, you might be in trouble. So, you know, this is a whole other level of the game that I think is beyond the scope of this. If you guys want me to go more into that, like larger battles and stuff... Uh, I could talk about that in another video, but I think that's beyond the scope of this. But just so you see in the expert book, there is this like this idea that you can hire like these zero levels. Um, and also, this is how I would treat like torchbearers. Like they've got non-fighter peasant here, uh, one gold piece per month. You could treat those guys as like torchbearers. Like it just give you an idea of what to pay them because a henchman is not, you know, is going to want more uh, more than that. So you can hire people like that. Just make it up based on your world and kind of stuff that you see here. That's how I would do it. And that's how I do do it. Um, but let me talk about this for one second. So that's expert. I want to show one more thing because I always like to go backwards. If we go all the ways to original Dungeons and Dragons, it doesn't say much about retainers and stuff. What it essentially says here is, um, in all probability, the referee will find it beneficial to allow participants in the campaign to hire and service one or more characters. It might be a band of mercenaries. Some, uh, however, 
uh, it's likely they might get an entourage is kind of what I'm summarizing. What they say essentially is, as a rule of thumb, a minimum offer of 100 gold pieces would require to tempt a human in service, dwarves more interested in gold, blah, blah. So in od d they're just talking about you just pay them to come on an adventure. So this is kind of more like a pay for fighting kind of thing, but they're a little bit of a higher level um, uh, type of thing versus like your, your foot soldiers which is kind of what we're looking at, right? So this is like your entry into uh, henchmen, if you were curious about that. Uh, so if you want to be as basic as possible, you could just be like, okay, the henchmen just get paid a certain rate. I like the idea that I'm taking a share of the treasure, and more and more I'm, I'm warmed up to the idea of them taking a share of the party's treasure, because I think that actually makes sense. You know, I think it makes sense because in world, you know, in around the table, right, if, if Crystal's got uh, two henchmen and nobody else does, it doesn't seem fair to, like, she is getting these extra, uh, more and more share of the gold, essentially, uh, because her henchmen are getting them. They're essentially her characters. But in the world, people don't think like that. I mean, there's somebody else. There's somebody who's in your party, right? That you, it's not really that way. So I think that works pretty well. And if I was going to um, advise a way to do it, I actually really like that. And also, you can give them a bigger share, because one of the other problems you have is, let's say that you have a charisma of 18, it's, it's a seven there. Like, how am I possibly going to have seven retainers if they only get a piece of my, a share of my treasure, right? So I think having them get a share of the party's treasure is good, whether it be a half share or quarter share, depending on maybe their level and what they've got going on, their level relative to the party, right? If you're like a third level party and you're hiring first level retainers, maybe they only get a 20% share. But if you're, if they're equal to your level, uh, maybe they get a higher share. Maybe they get a higher share if they're like a, a magic user or an elf versus if they were a... Uh, you know, a thief, let's say. So that's just different things to think about as far as breaking up the treasure and how you want to distribute it. Um, let's take a quick look here. I, I did make a little notes for myself because I don't have notes. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about, because I think this is important, um, about how we break down the treasure and stuff. I know I just kind of went over the rules there, but I'm going to kind of give some options. So one of the biggest drawbacks, I think, is that if the experience points if you look at the experience points of the retainers coming from the entire group a lot of dms might think that's not fair right because if everybody doesn't have a retainer then they're kind of losing out on experience points um if they don't have the retainer right um and the people that are taking advantage of the retainers are getting more experience points so is that fair i mean in a sense they're doing they're they have more characters doing stuff so maybe it is fair maybe it's not um so a lot of times people have an issue with that. And actually, when I ran in basic, when I was playing in a basic fantasy uh, campaign uh, with Marcus as the DM, uh, he did it this way, where we, the players, divided the experience points. Like we got, there was two of us, we each got half of the experience points, and then we distributed them to our retainers. Uh, we could do it any way we wanted, but it, I, I've seen some people do it where it's a certain percentage. So that if I have two or three retainers, then I will level up slower because I'm giving my experience points to them, if that makes sense. So, you know, all these things can work, but they, they feel like, again, we want this to feel like a benefit. We don't want it to feel like it's a lot of work. We don't want it to feel like it's penalizing. So you could, the simplest way to do it is just give them a share of the overall party's experience points or treasure. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, but here are a few other options um, that I think work pretty well. Um, you could just not count experience points for retainers at all and have them level with the PCs. So if you are... Um, start so if you're a first level character and you hire a, a, a retainer, they will uh, they're going to be half your level. So the way, I, the way I would do it in this case. So if you're first level and you hire a retainer, they are zero level. When you get to second level, they go to first. When you get to third level, they stay at first, right? Because it's, it's half round down. When you get to uh, fourth level, they go to second, and so on. They don't eat into your experience points. You pay them with, out of your own pocket. That all works out fine. And then you don't have to worry about it hurting anything. They just level with you, right? It's kind of like a benefit, a bonus, without, you know, uh, without any kind of penalty, which is, you know, might work well if you want people to have henchmen. Uh, another option is, uh, and I think this is, was suggested to me by Crystal actually a while back, which is why I'm mentioning her so much in the video, is um, that they don't actually level. They stay at first level in, until or unless your, your character dies. And at that point... Uh, at the end of that adventure, they don't. It doesn't miraculously happen like like Highlander. But at the end of that adventure, when they come back as a PC, they get experience points based on half of what the P, your PC had. So let's say you had a fighter with 
10,000 experience points, and they have this first level henchman. And if the fighter dies, uh, you know, the next session, the, that henchman can come back with 5,000 experience points, wherever that puts them level wise based on their class. And that's an interesting way to do it. It might be hard. We didn't try it, so I don't know how it works out. It might be hard, though, because if you get to higher levels, first level henchmen are very likely to die. So, you know, you kind of want your henchmen to level up. Um, and you could, another way to do it is they just level up based on the gold that you get, that you pay them, which is kind of what I was saying before. Essentially, if the, if Crystal gets a thousand gold pieces from a job and she gives the henchman a 20% share, she gives them 200 experience point, 200 gold pieces, they would get 200 experience points. I wouldn't cut it in half in addition to that, because that feels like it'd be pretty harsh. Um, so they wouldn't take it away from the player character. They would just get it as their experience points. So this is another way to do it. You know, you can really play around with it. It really kind of depends on how deeply you want to get into this, how many people are going to use them. If the henchmen come and go from the party, that's going to matter, right? You could have a henchman that gets hired, uh, let's say, when they're on first level in a town, and then they only hire them for one adventure, and they leave, and then, you know, they come back as fifth level, and you might have that, that henchman show up as a higher level character. So maybe they, maybe they level up that way. So there's lots of ways to play around with this. Uh, but the important thing is, I, I think, is the reason why we use henchmen, which is to kind of bolster the strength of the party, to give us backup characters. And we don't want to get away from that idea, right? We want to give the the party as much kind of oomph and strength as we can give them without making the PCs feel like they're never going to level up because the henchmen are eating up all the experience points. Um, so I, I will say this. So when, when I was running uh, Land of a Thousand Towers... Uh, campaign setting, we I required it right to have one henchman because I knew it was going to be deadly. It was a mega dungeon, and the way I did it in that one was I did the thing where each henchman got one share, each PC got two shares of the experience points, and it did seem to really slow down the progression. I think part of that, and I talked about this in other videos, is that the the module itself had very it was very cheap with the gold, so. Uh, keep that in mind too. If people are going to have henchmen, you know, make sure you give them enough gold so that it makes it worthwhile. So they're not like, oosh, we have these henchmen and we don't, we're getting barely any gold pieces. Why are we paying them? You know, so they'll be a bigger party. They'll be stronger, make the challenges more difficult and make the rewards greater. So I think that's everything I have for henchmen, guys. Let me know what you think um, below, you know, in the comments. And if you want to see other versions, you want to know more about like a group, like mass combat, how I would handle that, like larger groups. Like, oh, one more thing. See, I knew it. I knew there was something else. Oh, you know what? I'm also supposed to, you should like this video. I was told that I should don't tell people to like the video enough. <laughs> so if you if you're stuck around this long, go ahead and like the video. All right, so we're here we are. This is this is BX, but I've got here Astonishing Swordsman and Source of Hyperborea, which I love. And I can ask to do this video a couple times and I will do I think maybe the next one or the one after that. I'm gonna do a video on just the different systems I'm running and why. But for them, they've got this higher link section is interesting. In, in Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerer Hyborea, you can't get a true henchman like an assistant until you are higher level. Until then, though, you can hire what are effectively mercenaries in BX. Um, so let me just kind of read this little paragraph and we'll talk about it for a second. Hirelings might be employed to fill out the adventuring party. Hirelings are non player characters who ideally do not hug the spotlight or take focus away from the PCs. I think that's really good advice. Typically, they do not gain a share of the party's experience points, do not advance in levels, and are paid a modest wage. Uh, referee exceptions may apply. Hirelings may be managed by one or more players, typically, the player's character hired them, or by the referee. So, again, I usually make the player do it. Uh, charisma affects uh, con uh, contracting hirelings and maintaining their loyalty. loyalty. So here we've got a system where you can pick up these hirelings, like you've got lists of them here, armor bearer, guide, link boy, messenger, you've got crossbow, crossbowmen, infantrymen, slingers, and these are basically fighters. They're zero level because they have zero level uh, in Sasha Swordsman for listed. So they're zero level fighter types. They basically are there just to, f to fight. You know, they work for you, they're, they're mercenaries. And you can only have those until you get to higher level, where eventually you pick up, well, they've also a specialist. You also pick up henchmen, and henchmen is a classed individual attracted or compelled to serve a higher level character. So you definitely can look at that in two different ways, right? We've got our henchmen, which are our assistants. They are our buddies, our, you know, right-hand man, if you want. 
they are going to get a, a share of treasure. They're going to get experience points. They're going to level with you. They're like your partner, right? That's your Batman and their Robin, right? That's basically what they are. And they could even eventually take over if the PC retires or, you know, goes down <laughs> to a dragon or something, right? So that's kind of how we look at these things. I generally just let the players run them uh, unless they do something that seems completely off base uh, for the, like something suicidal or whatever. Um, you know, like a creature is going to attack their PC and it's like, no, my henchman runs up and jumps in front of the blade. I mean, if they have a crazy high morale and if they've been treated super well, that could happen. I'm not saying that it could never happen, but you know, that's less likely to happen, <laughs> you know, in that case. Um, so there you go, right? Uh, henchmen, hirelings, if you haven't already, uh, go ahead, like the video, uh, subscribe, ring the bell so you have notifications, and I'll see you next time.